Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. First off, I'd like to shout out to everyone. Happy New Year. This is 2021 and certainly most of us who have lived through 2020 realize what a chaotic and uncertain time that certainly was. After all, we had a lot of thoughts about how the economy was going to go, being masked in, watching businesses get destroyed and eliminated, and wondering whether or not the leaders that we actually put into place had our best interest in mind. Well, that's a time that you can also start working on your inner tools to find yourself at peace. That is true inner peace. Today we're going to be learning about things such as the problematic ego and how we can identify, manage, and tame it, how we can heal a sense of separation from others and come into the realization that we are all one. On our program today is a visionary who popularized the self-help genre, bringing revolutionary spiritual teachings to the forefront of modern culture. First publication, The Power of Now, introduced Eckhart Tolle to the world, and more than 25 years she has gone on to publish more groundbreaking books, inspirational books by such authors as Dr. Shafali Salbari, Michael Brown, and Dr. David Bercelli. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest and author of book, The How to Enter Peace, A Guide to a New Way of Living, our guest, Constance Kello. Constance, thank you for being on the program today. Oh, my pleasure, Daniel. Now, I certainly hope that I pronounced your last name correctly. Was that about right? That's right. Uh, (laughs) It rhymes with hello. Yeah, hello. Okay, see, I kind of went on instinct on that one there. Uh, Fabulous book, and I really enjoy that as people who are new to this, trying to find a way, you know, how do you go into situations and kind of relax and allow them to unfold without trying to entangle yourself in them? are certainly looking for answers, especially after all of last year. Right. Well, um, I don't think I was able to write this book until this time in my life. And a lot of things came together that really emphasized the need to write it and to put it out into our world. Uh, Why did I write this book? For several reasons. Um, Firstly, aren't we all? looking for more inner peace, especially during these uncertain times. Also, as a publisher, I've read many manuscripts and many books in the area of self-help and spirituality, and so many of them, Daniel, present the conceptual. And I wanted to move from the conceptual to the experiential. And that is why the how to enter peace is highly experiential. We don't know anything for sure unless we have personally experienced it. How do we know what it is like to be a parent unless you have experienced being a parent? How do you know what inner stillness is? Or even if it exists unless you have experienced it? How do you know what compassion is unless you have come from compassion and experienced it? Another reason is often when I would do spiritual teachings, the participants afterwards would come up to me and say, thank you for showing us the how. And I heard this so often that I wanted this book to do the same thing. Beyond this, Daniel, I feel the how is the new zeitgeist for our times. How do we heal systemic racism? How do we act to at least slow down global warming? How can we go beyond the conflict and polarities in our governments that stymie good government? There's such an urgency now, I think we all feel this, to find out the how to many things so that we can progress as mankind. It's how, 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 and we're challenged with it. So I do think it is kind of the new energy um, that we are experiencing on the planet right now to figure out how to live a better life personally and how to live more cooperatively and supportively together. 
Now, the most important thing besides how is to also give yourself the patience and the time and the practice to where you can come to the realization of the benefits of inner peace in ways that you thought, man, I didn't expect that because they show up very subtly. And as you reflect on that, it seems that it becomes larger then. And I guess a good example of that is I remember years ago I started noticing when I felt present, and you talk about presence in your book, Mm -hmm. is there I was one day, I was simply moving the laundry along in the garage, Mm -hmm. and I pulled it out of the dryer, and all I could think about was getting back to sit out and watch the movie that I was watching. So there was a sense of uh, a slight anxiety, you know, that I wanted to be there rather than where I was. Right. The beauty was during that time as I was working a lot with my thoughts, you know, and relaxing them and catching my thoughts, saying things. It's funny when you start paying attention to that, just how much that can send you down a rabbit hole sometimes, but back to the laundry. And here's what was cool. So I go, wait a minute, take a deep breath and just fold the laundry. It was really as simple as that. And so I did. So I felt both of my feet really just kind of Mm -hmm. absorb into the earth. Mm-hmm. And I relaxed, and I began folding my laundry, and the anxiety went away. Once this is done, I can get to what I want to do over here, but let's take care of this first. And once that was finished, there was this beautiful sense of satisfaction in something so simple. And I knew that it was kind of like, that's the key right there. <laughs> What's been your experience? Well, I really um, found it interesting that you said that you felt your feet grounded to the earth. And I think it's really important when one wants to be present is to be connected to the body. And it's through the body that we come into a sense of awareness and touch on really the animating life force within it. Um, I can go into length on that, uh, inner body meditation, if you like at this time. Sure. You know, give people a taste of what we're talking about for some who are really familiar with it. It could enhance what they already know. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Inner body meditation is, um, a kind of meditation that I don't think is that, well-known or practiced in the West. The two teachers I know who really support and um, encouraged and taught this practice were Eckhart Tolle and uh, Barry Long. So I, of course, had the great fortune to meet Eckhart, to be taught by Eckhart before he wrote anything, be taught in small group. And that's where I learned how to enter the body and feel the animating life force within it. And because the body is, the entry is through the body they say the kingdom is within how many times have we heard that daniel well yes the kingdom is within but how do we find the kingdom how do we find the kingdom so the body is in the field of consciousness and paradoxically holds all of consciousness within it so throughout the body everything is conscious even though we know that it's 99.9% empty space. So how can we find ourselves by going inside the body? It's been said that God is closer to us than hands and feet, but what is closer than hands and feet? The inner body. So we need to go within through meditation to experience that we are not our body, We are so much more. We are consciousness itself. 
And so that so-called 99.9% empty space is not empty at all. It is filled with consciousness. And when we practice inner body meditation, through um, guidance from a teacher initially, um, through putting attention and our intention to activate the consciousness within the body, we bring it alive and we can feel it within the body as some kind of um, vibration, uh, sizzling energy. And when we give attention to the body, the consciousness within it is activated and we become more conscious and that's how we can quickly raise the consciousness of ourselves and of our planet if enough people practice this we we take things for granted uh sometimes what's right in front of us we don't see Uh, Often in workshops, I would ask the participants, just look around. What do you see? And then I would get their responses, and of course they would mention the doors and the furniture and the chairs and everything. And sometimes none, sometimes maybe one in a group would notice the space, which is usually much more dominant than the objects. So here we are in this body. Many of us feel we're just a body. We've been carrying this body around with us, and we haven't really gone to explore what it is. It's like the, it's so obvious that we have missed it somehow. And uh, I want to show the how to enter the body ignite the body, ignite the consciousness within it so we become more conscious human beings. When when we talk about presence, to be present means that you bring the animating life force, that sense of your inner body to whoever you're speaking with, wherever you are, and that's what presence is. And when you do that, you can't help but be in the present moment. It's very powerful. When you have a conversation with someone, you can speak from your head. They speak back from their mental um, ideas. But you're not present. Enter the body. Feel the animating life force within it, the consciousness that you are, and you will be present with them. And Daniel, you can compare then a head-based conversation or one when you come from presence. And something happens, the conversation becomes deeper, more authentic, more healing, more enlightening. So, you know, we've got 70 to 100 trillion cells in the body. Every single one of them is highly conscious. And when we give them our attention, they just sing with gratitude because we've ignored them for so long, that consciousness within. I'm going to pick up the how, and I'm going to read two quotes related to inner body meditation. Um, The first one by Eckhart, Awareness of the Inner Body, is consciousness remembering its origin and returning to source. The second is, um, let me see, it's by um, Gurdjieff on presence. This is the chapter on presence. And Gurdjieff says, it is only by grounding our awareness in the living sensation of our bodies that the I am our real presence can be awakened. So it's um, 
once you start exploring this inner terrain, Daniel, it's just so fascinating. Just so fascinating. You know, from the power of the heart. Uh, it's uh, The heart has been known as, or we've come to know it as probably the higher brain. Am I going on too long? No, I think it's great. In fact, uh, you were, uh, here's the thing. It's really unique. Uh, one of the practices people can also begin is, we were, you know, I was talking earlier about doing the laundry and my mind's over somewhere right? else and putting it here. Now, here's another good one. <clears throat> when you're having conversations, right. much like what we're having here right now, right. and you became concerned with whether you were going on too long, but here was the thing. You know, I've been doing radio for a long time. <laughs> and one of the miracles of it is sometimes when you just allow things to go as they do naturally. And in this particular case, you were talking about the heart being known as the second brain. And one of the things in your book that I was really curious about asking you about was the physical heart and the power of it and what that all means. And you just led right into it naturally. <laughs> and the point I want to make at that is this. How often do us, all of us, find ourselves in a conversation with someone else and we can't wait until they stop talking so we can jump in and say what it is we want to say. But you're not really present for the conversation as it is. You just can't wait for your turn. You see the anxiety that's naturally there? Yes. Versus allowing an unfoldment. And I have sat many times with guests, whether it's face-to-face -face or on the phone like we are today, and there were all these questions and things that I wanted, you know, the interview to go particular ways. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm trying to, you know, I'm guiding it, but I'm, but as I allowed it, I realized these people are just going right into where I really kind of wanted to go anyway. And it was just really a kick in the booty. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're connected. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are, absolutely. <laughs> so let's talk about that, for instance, you know, the power of the physical heart, as you write about in your book. Well, <clears throat> um, interestingly, uh, well, we know that the heart was the first organ to develop in the fetus, but it's not simply a pump as some of us believe. Um, the body is electromagnetic. When I started delving into the wisdom within the body, I was just surprised over and over again of the, the beauty of the physical body, the beauty of the subtle body, the um, intelligence within the body that we haven't tapped into, by and large. Um, so the body's electromagnetic, we know that, and that's why we can't live very long without water, because water is the conductor. Um, and also, through the research, I found that the heart is 70 to 100 times stronger electrically, 5,000 times stronger magnetically than the brain. That's why the heart has such a greater capacity to manifest than simply the brain. In the how to inner peace, there's a whole section that I write on noble intention. And noble intention is when you come from the heart. And then things can manifest much more quickly. And when you come from the heart, you're not coming from the mind that's entwined with the ego. So it's not something that you um, intend for your own egoic purposes. It's something you intend out of love. It could be love for yourself and love for others. And then when you set that noble intention from your heart, the power is phenomenal. We're tapping into, you know, that strong, strong magnetic force of love. So, with the heart having all these neurons, 40,000, if I'm correct, um, you can say it has its own brain system, even though 
there are no brain cells in the in the heart. We can know with our heart. Anyone who comes from, like, just as you said, um, there was an interruption, uh, a stop, and a start, and there was some way in which we were connecting, and now we're talking about the power of the heart. Yeah, um, it's it's all it's amazing. I could go on. I just uh, I don't want to kind of my. It, my inclination is to give the full load when I can, Daniel. So stop. I understand. <laughs> if it's enough, if it's enough to take in at one time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And again, we could talk about this. We can share tools right. and certainly practices. But it was much like a, a good friend of mine years and years ago when I started in exploring uh, the uh, spirit, if you will, of Japanese Zen. You know, what is this? Mm -hmm. That was sort of like my awakening back in my early 20s. And he says, you know, you can read all the books you want to, all over the world, the secret text, but until you put it into practice and have the experiences, and they start, and then they start going deep. And I think the funny thing about Westerners when it comes to, let's call it the Asian philosophies, is they read about all this mysticism, the poetry, mm-hmm. and, and all these fantastic occurring events. And they say, well, I'm sitting here and I'm breathing in and out and doing the meditations and counting breaths and doing all these things I'm supposed to do, but what is it I'm supposed to experience? Now, here's what was interesting. I really love this one uh, quote that you started Chapter 7 off with, and that was, the Buddha was asked, quote, mm-hmm. what have you gained from meditation? Now, I remember I was in that state in the early years, and you'd kind of abandon it like a lot of Westerners will in the beginning. But anyway, he replied, nothing. However, let me tell you what I have lost. Anger, anxiety, depression, insecurity, and the fear of death. (laughs) 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 If you're going to lose anything, there you go. (laughs) But, you know, what's really fascinating about that is those are really all the symptoms, I would think, of the ego. Exactly. Now let's go ahead and talk about that because you do it at, at fair length in here, and I think sometimes many people know what ego is, but let's talk about the experience of ego because that quote right there alone really kind of says it all, doesn't it? It does. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can see how I've tried to scope and sequence the content of the How to Enter Peace. Mm-hmm. And why did I go to the ego? Because I emphasize from the get-go, if you want to find inner peace, you have to find out who you truly are. And the ancient Greeks, of course, knew this because of the oracle at Delphi that said, know thyself. And after all these years, these thousands of years, have we really come close have we come have we progressed in knowing who we truly are and i think one of the impediments well i believe strongly i have experienced strongly that perhaps the greatest impediment to finding out who you truly are and that's why meditation is so good because when you meditate regularly you somehow through some um some process that I can't explain, you become more of who you truly are. You become less angry. You become more patient. You become more compassionate. Fears you had carried for years just drop away. I can't explain the alchemy, the spiritual alchemy of meditation, but only, you know, the outcomes that people experience. Mm -hmm. And I have myself. So the ego... Um, what is it? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, um, mm. people say the ego. We need the ego. What are you, you're asking me to drop the ego? That's who I am. That is the crux of it. Mm-hmm. When you identify with the ego as who you are, how can you find out who you truly are? So the ego is, um, well, to put it in a context, uh, I don't know when, but in our evolution as Homo sapiens, at one time we were hunters and gatherers. 
and we needed to fight to get food. We needed to fight to defend ourselves, our family, uh, our clan from other aggressors. And so it was embedded within the species as a construct for protection. So, and the ego still serves a great purpose in that role. When um, we want to take care of our health, when we want to buckle up our seat belts, um, look at this pandemic, when we want to take precautions so that we don't get the pandemic nor spread it to anyone else. Now, that's the, that's the ego construct for protection used wisely. It, but the ego kind of got away with itself, and it's created so much fear. If you want to know where the ego is, hunt the fear. Hunt the fear, and you'll find that's the ego. So the first thing is the ego has become, over time, really dysfunctional, really problematic in that it creates fears. It, it's kind of crazy glued to our thinking mind at this time uh, in our evolution. But now it's taken on you know, a role that often works against our welfare. It creates all kinds of fears, uh, regrets. Um, and that's why most of our thoughts are repetitive and most of them are negative. Because the ego lives along that line of past and future. And when we are in the present moment, where's the ego? You can't find it. You're present. Because the ego lives on our story. And it'll go back and it'll pick up things and all of that uh, and loop around and loop around. I think we've all had those experiences of, oh, my God, I'm back to that thought again, or, oh, I'm back to that person again. And it's like we can't control it. The only way we can start controlling the ego is, first of all, to disidentify it, disidentify from it, I mean. And um, so we have to recognize the ego first. And then when we see it in operation, know that that is not who we are in our entirety. We still have that ego with us. And it can be, it is useful um, in self-protection, protection protection of others, but it's, it's got out of, it's got out of hand. And it kind of is a ruler of many people and uh, causes a lot of anxiety. What, uh, there's a quote, um, I think the Buddha said this, what the um, unfocused mind can do to you is worse than any enemy can do to an enemy or a foe to a foe. So it's painful to be controlled by the ego. It's painful. We don't need that pain. So we all know, you know, how it brings up worries and regrets and imaginings and all of that. So part of finding out who we truly are, and it's part, is to know that we are not that problematic ego and disidentify from it. So when these thoughts come up that are negative, um bring regret, I say, I'm exiting. (laughs) I keep saying, I'm exiting. I'm out of here. I'm not going to feed the ego. That could be, you know, a sweet little practice if, if people feel it's appropriate for them. But the ego, um, yeah, present moment, recognize it's not who you are. When it gets problematic, um, and and admit, you know, that the ego still that that unhealthy 
aspect of the ego still has, has a tremendous grip on us. And how can we recognize the ego? First of all, well, I said when there's fear. And then when you, you want to be better than, you want to be richer than, you want to be smarter than, or when you feel the negative part, I'm not good enough, I'm not going to make it, how can I do that? Poor me. So when you start comparing yourself with others, um, the inflated ego wants to be inflated. It wants to feel puffed up. So whenever you feel puffed up regarding something, that's the ego that's basically saying, I'm better. I'm better than you. I'm richer than you. I have a designer bag you can't afford, whatever. And the negative ego is, oh, she's so lovely. I know I'll never be able to achieve her attraction or whatever. We all, we've lived through this. I could go on for forever as examples, but this has to ring true to every human being, I believe. Well, you know, it's so true, too, when you think about what you're saying here, uh, Constance, especially when you consider America and the idea of celebrating celebrity. Yeah, and all absolutely. of a sudden, these people become so self-important. I mean, look at how they've been over this last year. You don't hear much from them now, though. But in Britain, they find this rather unusually curious that we celebrate celebrity to the level that we do. <laughs> these Absolutely, people, Daniel. You know, and it's funny because these people don't experience things any differently than the rest of us. And a good example, I mean, by that, I remember years ago I was listening to, I think it was Coast to Coast AM, and there was a guy who was a guest on the show who basically is a skeptic about things until you can prove with good physical evidence that something is true. And mm -hmm. One of the phenomenons they were talking about was UFO, you know, sightings, aliens, all these kind of things. That, that, and and uh, he says, so the host says to him, he says, well, you know, here was this colonel uh, in the Air Force, 30-plus uh, years of flight experience, so forth and so on. And he says, you know, I'm kind of really getting tired of people bringing this up. You know, this is a colonel who's in the Air Force. He's got 30-plus years of experience you know, but yet he hasn't produced physical evidence. Now, look, we all experience the same sort of things in the physical world, each one of us. And he says, now, look, if I had a UFO come and land in my backyard, the alien comes out and shakes my hand and disappears, <laughs> and I go and I tell people about it, but I don't have any physical evidence, what I expect them to do is look at me thinking that I'm out of my mind. <laughs> you know, because there's no physical evidence. And I thought, how true is that like with everything else that we've surrendered ourselves over to people that we think are better than we are? Absolutely, Daniel. You know, and so it brings up a really fascinating point in why the work that you're talking about here in your book is so important. Uh, as the Buddha said, the things I have lost, one of them was anxiety. Well, I've been in radio a long time, and I've studied a lot about how advertising works and, you know, the subliminal persuasion and the propaganda. We've seen probably a couple of lifetime times of fulfillment of propaganda this last year, <laughs> you know, uh, mixed messages. But you have to question yourself when you think of the ego, who are you really? Well, that's part of the book. Um to, again, go back and repeat myself, to find out who you truly are, part of the process is to find out who you are not. And so, uh, Daniel, we identify with the roles we play. We identify with um, our net worth. We identify with uh, the people we know. We name drop, you know, we kind of puff ourselves up because we know a certain celebrity or somebody with a, a high positive public profile. We identify with all these things and they are not who we are. And these are all listed in the book, uh, or most of them. I hope I captured most of them. And one of them, and this brings up this notion of, why are we mesmerized by celebrities? 
I don't know. It, we lionize them. They're just like us. We are all brothers and sisters. We are all made of the same stuff. We are all consciousness. We, there's no comparisons. Once the ego goes, you don't feel better than. You don't look up to somebody and idolize them because they seem to, you know, be so important. Um, there's a story of this monk, and he was apparently a, a wonderful spiritual teacher and spent his whole life in spiritual practice, and no one could kind of throw him off, so to speak. He always came from truth, from peace, from kindness. And then one day he was to meet um, a grand celebrity or king or something like that. And he found he was nervous. His palms started sweating. So he knew he had built this person up. And it made him nervous. He didn't feel um, maybe equal to the company or just made him nervous. Like if Oprah calls, what do you do? <laughs> you get sweaty palms. Um, so, and then he knew, the monk knew, I still have to practice. I still have to go back because I would not be nervous. I would not make comparisons. I would not see anyone as better or lesser than myself. And until, you know, I master that, I still need to go back to practice my spirituality. You know, and that's the beauty of the whole thing is you look to the ego which simply says, you are unique in this world. Now, the puzzle, if you will, is to unfold exactly what that is. Um, yes, and that is why you have to find out who you truly are. And, you know, the, you know, my highest intention is that the how to inner peace will provide an avenue for our coming in to know that we are extensions of our divine source. And when we come to that awareness through our spiritual practice, through meditation, through inner body meditation in particular, um, the problematic false ego that just falls away. You know, it, it, the false ego has ruled humans for thousands of years. But once we come into the realization that we are extensions of our divine source, and I know this, this image has been used often, that there's the sun and then there's the sunbeams that emanate from the sun. But the beams aren't different from the sun. They just come from the sun. And so it's hard for us to know that we have been created by divine source. And it's, I think, A Course in Miracles says, parents can give birth to children, but children can't give birth to parents. They can only give birth to other children. So we cannot be the source, the creator. We are the created from our divine source. And as we grow in love and compassion and um, all the positive things that we can demonstrate as human beings, we become more aware of that that, well, of course, the miracle says, teach only love, for that is who you are. I can't put it any, any better than that. Now, I'm curious, as people have been able to, to get your book here, uh, The Now to Inner Peace, what have been their experiences as they've put it into practice and how their lives have changed? Daniel, that could be a follow-up interview. The book has not come out yet. Its publication date is January 15th. I didn't want it to come out during the um, 
election year in the U.S. I didn't want it to come out too soon um, with the um, awareness of the pandemic because people were not in that headspace to kind of sit and and do the practices. Um, it's the practices in the book that are woven throughout it that assist you to come into the experience of the content. Um, and so if you go to, you know, um, the website, www.constancekello.com, you can hook into um, a guided inner body meditation led by myself. Now, the ideal is to have read the book first because there's a lot of kind of stuff that goes before it in preparation to go into that full inner body meditation. But it's there. And um, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, yeah, so it's it's about experience. It's about experience. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, you just, you change. Mm -hmm. And you don't know how, um, but you've changed. And you've come to know that, you know, this physical body is not physical at all. We identify with it. We dress it up. We put makeup. We get our hair cut regularly. We take all our vitamins and everything to keep this physical body as we want it to be, and yet it's not who we are. So once we do find out who we truly are, which is really love in essence, um, and we find that out by practicing loving, th loving ways, um, all of those other things out there just fall away. They're not important. I walk by a magazine stand and I see all of these glamour magazines and all of these people magazines and all of these celebrity magazines and it's like, oh, that's not important. Mm -hmm. That is not important. That has nothing to do with my reality as I experience it. So... Well, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and it takes work, and it takes a lot of practice. It takes work, Daniel. We'll, yeah, and when the time comes, though, you'll start to see subtly, and then all of a sudden it'll be in a big way uh, as your work pays off, and uh, you begin to experience things much differently. You'll see opportunities, as you said earlier, that you would never seen right in front of you before. Uh, just a lot of really unique uh, changes actually happen. Right. So um, the book is not out yet. You can order it online through any online bookstore. Um, they've been taking pre-orders for a long time. And uh, so it will be interesting. I can't wait, Daniel, to get feedback from readers. And further questions as well. I love questions, as you do, I'm sure. Well, absolutely. You know. Uh, is there a website people can go and find out more about your work? And, uh, you know, again, uh, the book will be coming out here, as you said, very soon. Uh, and they can find out more about who you are and uh, how they can get started. Yes. Um, it's www.constancekello.com. And um, you can find out about the two books I've put out one being The How to Enter Peace, the other which came out in um, December. December 1, I believe, was the publication date. Uh, the Chronicles of Biza, Student of Truth. You can get a lot of information on those two books. You can get information on myself as a, a meditation teacher, specifically inner body meditation as I teach it. Uh, you can get a lot of information on Namaste Publishing that I founded about, what, 23 years ago, and the books that we've published. Um, there's, there's a lot of information there. And, uh, yeah, so it's kind of multi-pronged when you go to just ConstanceCallow.com. You can go to the, the home page, and, and then you can explore as you are prompted to. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program today and sharing this with us. And uh, I'm sure people look forward to uh, the book when it comes out. And uh, be an exciting year, definitely. <laughs> it will be, for sure. <laughs> well, Constance, thank you for being on the program today. It's been a real pleasure to have you. Oh, Daniel. Ditto. Ditto. Um, so I just want to say um, blessings to you and um, all your listeners. And namaste. Very good. Thank you again. Okay. 
We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and stay up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. And remember, live your day past halfway.